Hello, everyone. Okay. Welcome to the June 2016 edition of the Wikimedia Foundation's monthly metrics meeting. Great to see you all here. Uh, those of you who are coming back from Wikimedia, welcome back. Good to see you. Uh, so we've got a full agenda today, as always. Um, we'll start with the welcome, then do a community update, um, metrics update, uh, something from research and a product demo before Catherine comes on and gives a quick PD update uh, as our new official executive director. Uh, then we'll do some Q&A. Guillaume is uh, taking questions on IRC and um, then trying a little bit of positivity at the end of the meeting as well, <laughs> which we'll get to later. Uh, so welcoming some new hires and contractors. Uh, we have Emerald converting. <laughs> your hard work. Also Joe Walsh, Leon Ziemba, and Delphine. And then we have new contractors, Minakshi, <laughs> Rikita, oh, oh, sorry, let me try that again. Uh, Ridika, is that right? I hope so. Uh, Laureen and Liz. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Uh, then we have some anniversaries. I won't read them all here, but let's call out uh, Seddon, Victor, Jamo, Rob, Chad, and Kaldari, who have been here for five and six years. <laughs> and people who made it through their first year at the foundation, Max, David, David, Leanne, Sarah, Peter, and Amy. Take it around. All right, and now on to Alex for our community update. Hi, I'm Alex with the Community Engagement Team. Um, we have a few exciting updates. Obviously, Wikimania at Silvario um, was attended by a number of staff, I think around 100. It took place in a beautiful village, I hear, near Lake Como. Um, a town of 760 people was overrun by over 1,000 Wikimedians. Um, there were hackathons, learning days, um, lots of great discussions. I had to stop following some people on Instagram because I couldn't handle seeing all the beautiful photos. Um, yeah. <laughs> Wiki Loves Earth um, took place in May and June. Um, last year, uh, they had over 100,000 submissions from 26 participating countries. This year, again, there's over 26 countries participating, including, including Iraq, Azerbaijan, Tunisia, Venezuela, um, all natural or areas of natural beauty and um, significance. This year, something cool is the Wiki Loves Earth organizing team, who is the Ukrainian chapter, is partnering with UNESCO to focus on biosphere reserves. Um, and UNESCO is highlighting this partnership in their media and communication. So that's super exciting. Um, in the Indic languages, the Odia, Odia Wikipedia, um, is turning 14 years, Odia Wiktionary, 11 years, and Punjabi Wikipedia is turning 14 years. So these guys are, and girls, are crushing it online. <laughs> um, milestones, Italian Wikisource reached 100,000 text units, Kyrgyz Wiktionary reached 200,000 page edits, and the Armenian Wikipedia reached 200,000 articles. Woo. Three new user groups were created, including the Florida Librarians, Wikiversity Journal, and Kentucky Um In July, we're continuing our global metrics consultation run by Sati. Um, and so please update the collaboration calendar on Meta if you're doing any type of consultation, survey event that has more than 50 people um, engaged. And metrics. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm the lead product manager in Discovery. I'm here to talk to you about metrics. So two things before I start the slides. The first update is that we've been looking at the zero results rate a lot, as a lot of you are familiar with. Um, we actually have changed the way that it's calculated recently to remove a load of things which were being counted incorrectly. For example, like things that were happening in the back end that didn't really correlate to a user query were sometimes being counted as zero results. Actually means the zero results rate is a little bit lower than we thought it was, which is good. Um, and the second thing is I have a live demo 
for about a second to show you. So um, it's not come out very well on this, unfortunately. Hopefully those of you that are online can see it a bit better. But we're pleased to announce that on Wikivoyage, all, all Wikivoyages, we now have these dynamic maps. So um, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, um, you can pan around, you can click on all the points of interest which are referenced in the article, and you can see the cross-references on the left-hand side. So this is available to be used on all wiki voyages. It's now up to users to actually migrate these over. We're not doing the migrations ourselves. We want people to do it when they're ready and when it's got all the features that they need. So if you have any feedback on this, please let us know. We'd love to talk to you about it. Now back to the slides. OK. So now I'm going to talk about our updates to wikipedia.org. So on the 20th of May, we launched a new footer on wikipedia.org. And this is a, a screenshot of the footer. So you can see it tells you that we're host, the site's hosted by the Wikimedia Foundation, links to a lot of the sister projects, and um, describes them a little bit. Because you know, MetaWiki might not mean a lot to your average reader or the average person that goes on this site. So um, what we actually saw when we did this, well, this is, this is the old footer. So it looks pretty similar, but um, it's not got the descriptive text. The fact that it's a Wikimedia project isn't as um, highly noticeable. So mostly just a cosmetic change, right? Well, no, actually. Um, the effect here is that users are actually now slightly more likely to navigate to sister projects when they go to the site. So these cosmetic changes can actually make a difference to the way that people use the site. And um, this is a screenshot of Wikivoyage. So um, that was definitely a, a good thing there. Um, and on the 2nd of June, we launched language detection. So what you might note, this is a screenshot from wikipedia.org. Uh, you might notice something a bit different. It's in Latvian. Um, and it's suggesting a couple of other languages, like Russian is, is suggested, and English, and so on. So um, you may now be wondering, well, why did you just change wikipedia.org to be Latvian? That can't be good for everyone. Well, how does it know what language to choose? It looks at your browser. So what I actually did here to get it to show these languages was I changed the languages that I have in my browser. So I said that Latvian is my most preferred lang language, then English, then Russian, then Japanese. If you actually look, Japanese is there too. Um, so it's called the accept language header, basically. That's the technical name for it. Um, so what actually happened as a result of this, users are now actually more likely to go to Wikipedia in their language. So although the, we did see slightly more people actually engaging with the links that, that were already there. The number of people was about the same. The big difference was where they actually went. Previously, people would pretty much just go to English because it was the first one there. But now that we're actually showing people the language that they have in their browser, they're much more likely to go to that rather than to English or to, what, to whatever. So we're actually serving people content in their language rather than forcing them to use it in English, which is definitely a good thing too. So um, why do we care about wikipedia.org? Well, it's a multi multilingual entry point to Wikipedia. I said this when I presented three months ago. Now it's even more multilingual because we have, this is the English version. So now, now we have the actually people getting it in their language, which is great. Um, and we get around 14 million page views per day on this site. So again, not inconsequential. It does actually account for a lot of users. So thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone in Discovery who made this possible. Um, if you want to check out our Q1 goals, they're on MediaWiki.org, so you can click on those. And the, uh, our mailing list and my email address is there if you want to speak to me, or you can speak to me afterwards or on IRC. Thank you. And now, research. All right. I'm going to be presenting from up here in beautiful, cloudy Seattle. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And presenter mode. All right, can everybody see me? Perfect. Hello, everybody. I'm Jonathan from the design research team. Today, I'm going to share some findings from a research study of how college students use free online information resources like Wikipedia for school. This study is part of an ongoing collaboration between product and research to better understand and support the needs of our readers. 
Unlike many previous studies of Wikipedia use in education contexts, which are focused on Wikipedia as a teaching tool, we were primarily interested in how students use Wikipedia and other internet resources outside the boundaries of the classroom and the syllabus. Now, those of you who are young enough to have been in college after about 2005, um, I just barely missed this cutoff, probably used Wikipedia this way yourselves at some point. If so, you weren't alone. Students frequently use Wikipedia to supplement their official course resources, whether they're completing homework assignments, cramming for a test, or writing a research paper. We were interested in learning more about why students turn to Wikipedia. Is it because they find it accurate and up-to-date? Because, because of the quantity of content available or the breadth of topics covered? Because it's freely available and easy to access? Or because of something else entirely? Specifically, we wanted to learn why students are still turning to Wikipedia today in 2016. Because we know that a lot has changed since 2001 when Wikipedia was launched. The way people use the internet has definitely changed. Many more people access the internet on mobile devices, they're accessing more multimedia content, and thanks to social media, there are now many more ways for people to interact with that content and with one another over the internet. But how have these changes affected the information consumption habits and the information needs of students? We also know that since 2001, many other sites and services have appeared that allow people to access useful information on the internet for free. Many of these sites provide different kinds of content than Wikipedia, or they present it in different ways. For example, optimized for mobile or for multimedia. Some of these sites may work better than Wikipedia for certain students' learning styles or help them learn about certain subjects more effectively. Students may prefer them over Wikipedia in particular learning contexts or for particular use cases. So we wanted to know when and why do students choose other sites over Wikipedia when they do? Answering that question can help us understand how to prioritize our product work and to better address our users' needs. To get at the answer, we went straight to the source and asked the students themselves. Our goal was to understand how modern college students use free online information resources, which we're calling FOIRs for purposes of acronym, including but not limited to Wikipedia. We surveyed students to find out which resources they turn to most often, why they choose those resources over others, and what they found most valuable about those resources. In order to avoid biasing the students, we never mentioned Wikipedia or any other resource by name in the survey. We wanted to collect a variety of examples, so we defined what a FOIA was in very general terms. It had to be free to use and accessible via the internet. College provided resources like a course website or a subscription journal didn't count, and neither did search engines. We developed the survey in partnership with a group of students at the University of Washington in Seattle and had those students distribute the survey through the online communication channels that they and their peers use regularly, mostly Facebook groups, Twitter, um, Snapchat, and listservs. We received 214 responses over two weeks. Here are a few of the things we found. The rest of the findings will be available in the research report, which is linked at the end of this presentation. Not surprisingly, we found that students draw on a wide range of resources of many different types for many different reasons. However, there were definitely some standouts. Video streaming sites, online courses, and social Q&A sites were popular, as was a certain free encyclopedia. Many of the less common resources that people named were subject specific, and many of these focused on, on sciences and engineering disciplines, probably because our server survey population contained a lot of engineering students. But social media and news sites were also well represented. Speaking of that free encyclopedia, Wikipedia was the most mentioned site by far. YouTube, Stack Overflow, Khan Academy, and Coursera rounded out the top five. In the survey, we asked students to briefly describe why they used each of the resources they named. Here's what they said about us. These responses indicate that students find a lot to like about Wikipedia. It's well-maintained and well-written. 
It serves as a good jumping off point for research. It's easy to find the information that students need in Wikipedia. And its prominent place in Google search rankings makes it very visible and accessible. These responses also suggest some familiar prejudices still exist. For example, students have a, have a sense that Wikipedia is less reliable than other sources. And the final quote in particular raises the issue that our continued popularity is a bit of a, of a self-reinforcing thing. One of the reasons students use Wikipedia, rather than something else, is that we're popular and highly ranked. In other words, that a lot of people use Wikipedia. This tends to make us easy, easy to find, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're inherently better than uh, any other resource that students could be using. We also ask students several questions about how they generally consume information from free online resources. Fortunately for us, the results of, of these questions show that most students still read a lot on the internet, although most of what they're reading is short form text, like summaries or abstracts. And they also watch video more often than they read whole articles or books online. We also ask students to rank features or characteristics of the resources they use by importance. One area we were particularly interested in, interested in was mobile use. So we asked students how they prefer to access free online information resource content on mobile devices through downloads like podcasts or eBooks, a mobile web browser, multimedia streaming, or apps. On average, students ranked, ranked access to content via mobile web and streaming as more important than via downloads or apps. We found a lot more interesting stuff as well, which I don't have the time to co cover today. Uh, my general takeaways from this study is that while Wikipedia can tend to, continues to serve students' needs well, there are opportunities for us to make our content easier to use for education purposes. One thing we could do uh, would be to make it easier to create and locate audio and video content on Wikimedia projects. Another possibility might be to make it easier for people to remix the content that's already hosted on our projects to create custom learning modules around particular topics. I'm obviously curious to hear your ideas as well. So happy to take your questions or comments at the end of metrics or offline. That's it for today. Quick shout out to uh, Mark Zachary, professor at UW, and the 10 uh, undergraduate students who worked with me on this project. And thank you all very much. Hello, I'm Ryan Caldari with the Community Tech Team. Uh, this month for the product demo, uh, we're going to have a demo of a new beta feature developed by the Wikimedia Deutschland TCB team. Uh, in case you don't know what the TCB team is, uh, they're basically the equivalent of community tech, but under Wikimedia Deutschland. Um, and they have some really great engineers that we love collaborating with. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Toby and Fish to introduce the revision slider extension. Hi. Hi, from um, Germany. So this is Fish. I'm Toby. We are from the TCB team um, uh, at Wikimedia Germany. Um, basically, the TCB team, for those who don't know it yet, um, we are um, uh, especially working on wishes from, that come from the German-speaking community. And we're closely working together with the community tech team. And thank you, Ryan, for introducing. Um, but today we are talking about a tool we developed um, called the Revision Slider. This is a great example how our um, uh, teams, uh, the community tech team and the TCB team uh, work together. Um, basically, we had on our wish list from the German community a wish that said, basically, um, as a user, um, when I look at a diff, I want to be able to easily see all the edit comments of edits between um, two revisions. Um, and originally, when we thought about that wish, um, we were totally not having something like the revision slider in mind. Um, but then we got to know um, from a community tech team that they were working on something called Revision Slider um, that is based on another gadget called a Revision Jumper. And we looked at it and uh, we said, oh, cool, that is going to solve our wish as well. Um, so community tech team 
uh, worked out a prototype um, of that um, of that tool, which was a gadget. And then the international uh, 2015 um, wish list survey came in, and the community tech team had a lot of other things, a lot of other important things to do, and they had no resources left to like. Uh, get that out of prototype state. So we agreed that um, TCB team picks that project up, and we were working on getting it out of um, the prototype state. Um, we took a test-driven um, approach of, of coding uh, this tool, and we also worked closely together with our UX team that was doing a lot of user testing during the development phase already. And so we turned the revision slider into a nice uh, little media wiki extension. And here we are. And that was enough of uh, like storytelling from my side. So I'm heading over to Fish, who will yes. show you the tool. Yeah, so we will have a small demo of it. Um, I imported uh, the Wikipedia article from the English Wikipedia. But that's about bread. Um, I imported not the whole article, but enough revisions to have something to show. Um, to uh, enable the extension, so it's, uh, we made an extension that's available as a beta feature, so you have to go to your preferences and be logged in, and there you can activate the extension. Now when you go to the history page and compare revisions, you will land on the diff page, and there the revision slider is loading. Um, there it is. In the background, uh, it loads um, from the API the metadata of the last 500 revisions available. Um, we are working on a patch that will load data in chunks so that we have no limits. But that's it for now. The bars you see um, uh, represent um, revisions, and bars going up represent addition of content. Bars going down represent um, content that was removed. Uh, when you hover the bars, you see the metadata, so uh, the usernames, the comment, um, the size of the page, the size of the change. To uh, look at a certain um, diff, you have these pointers that you can move around. So the yellow pointer represents kind of the old diff you're looking at, and the blue one, the, the new one. And everything in between you can compare. So if you want to look at a certain thing, you can just move them by drag and drop. And there it loads. You can also move them by clicking. So now I compare these two revisions and see what happened in between. You can also move to older revisions by clicking on the arrows. And there you can see that the pointers kind of stick to the side because they are out of scope. But still, I can use them and can drag them here. And now I'm comparing everything that happened in between these changes. So not much, apparently. Um, yeah, we also. Um, included a small tutorial. So when a user first uses this extension, this tutorial will pop up. And it um, describes shortly what, what's done here and what you can do with it. And there we are. We plan to go on the German Wikipedia live soon with it as a beta feature. And there are also other wikis that um, said they're interested. So yeah, that's the two. OK. Um, so if you want to try it out yourself, um, it's at the moment deployed to beta. Um, it will, uh, I think, very soon be deployed to test Wikipedias. And then we will go live first on the German Wikipedia and then on all the rest. Hopefully. Thank you very much. So if you have any questions, just poke us. And um, yeah. Okay. Thanks for watching.
Hi. Can you guys hear me? All right. Um, good to see you all. My apologies that I am not with you all in San Francisco today. To be honest, if I had known that there had been an announcement planned last week, I probably would have made an effort to be there uh, for today's presentation. It is awesome to be with you all here at the Foundation, and I am going to ask Heather to sort of walk through my slides today. We have some things to go over. I want to talk a little bit about things that happened at Wikimania and talk a little bit about the presentation that I made to the board on strategy and what that means for us at the Foundation and the movement. But somebody reminded me that normally what happens at this point is that the outgoing executive director introduces the new executive director. We don't really have anyone to do that. So even though we've worked together for about two years, I thought it might be useful to step back and reintroduce myself. Apologies in advance to those of you who are in Wikimania and as an Olario and have already seen these slides. But getting started, hi everyone. This You may recognize one of our kittens from the kitten cam uh, about two weeks ago at the office. I just thought there would be a nice background as we talked through um, some things. So. I'm Catherine, you've known me all for a little while. I am from the East Coast of the United States, which is where I'm coming from you t coming to you from today. Um, I became interested in free culture and open movements um, when I was a student in Egypt back a long time ago. Um, in 2007, I began the beginning of what I see as my journey to the foundation uh, when I was working for the organization UNICEF testing what were MediaWiki extensions designed to improve accessibility um, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia for people with auditory and visual impairments trying to create information networks based on wikis. Our efforts failed, but we learned a lot about accessibility and we learned a lot about MediaWiki and in fact some of those things were presented at the 2008 Wikimania in Alexandria, Egypt. So that was a while ago, um, and in the period between then and joining the foundation in 2014, I spent a lot of time working in open movements around improving community accountability, transparency, uh, participation, uh, fighting for digital rights for people around the world, um, from places like Tunisia to Myanmar to Haiti. And in 2014, I joined the foundation as the head of communications. The reason for that was pretty simple. Um, after years spent working with global movements and global communities and years trying to stitch together open source, open culture um, with social change, it became really obvious to me that working at a place like Wikimedia Foundation, working with the Wikimedia movement, there really was no better place uh, to combine these things that I felt passionate about and loved. And after spending two incredible years with you all, uh, the board on Friday of last week let me know that I had the opportunity to spend another um, few incredible years with you all, this time in the role of executive director. And I very gratefully and excitedly and somewhat shocked accepted. Uh, and so I just wanted to say thank you all. I wish that I could be there with you today and I'm looking forward to getting back to the foundation. For those who are not at the foundation, I'm looking forward to seeing you all over the course of the coming weeks and months through get-togethers, through meetups, uh, through travels, and then ultimately hopefully all at all hands. And I want to talk a little bit about Wikimania and what we saw at Wikimania. So Heather, I think Heather Walls isn't, oh wait, I forgot something. Excuse me. I forgot that no introduction would be complete if I didn't introduce myself with the one thing that everybody in this room cares about, which was, what was my first article? <laughs> Next slide. Just hang out here and look at the kitten. There's troubleshooting coming from the room. Well, so in 2014, in October, I started to, I took the plunge and tried editing Wikipedia for the first time, not just as a random IP editor, but with a username accountable for all the things that I would do, and, <coughs> oh, Hangout crashed. All right. Well, those of you on the Hangout, we can, can hang out for a little bit. Well done so far. 
<laughs> Why did you decide to do that article? Oh. Uh, I will. I'll talk about that. Excellent. All right. Is everyone back? And excellent. All right. Affirmation. Cool. So um, perhaps we can move forward to the next slide. I wanted to talk a little bit about that thing that makes us who we are, which was the very first article that I ever edited. There you go. There it is, 2014, October. Uh, I sat there alone one evening, and I just learned that something about myself, which is that I like writing articles from scratch. Um, I think it is a lot of fun, and I really enjoy it, and this is the first one I tried. You'll see if you go back and look at the history. I made a lot of mistakes in terms of citations. Um, I'm really a big fan of Cytoid. I think it's a pretty awesome product, uh, and have learned a lot since first getting started with this. While we were down in the crash, Jonathan Morgan asked me why I chose to edit this article. This article is about a homeless housing development in Los Angeles in Skid Row. Um, and I, because I came across it and I was interested in learning more about it and there was nothing there, I checked Wikipedia to see if we had uh, articles about luxury buildings in San Francisco and we did and so it felt only fair to also write about housing for the homeless on Wikipedia. So that is my first article. So moving on. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Wikimania and the and sort of what I was hearing there. On uh, Wednesday and Thursday of the coming days, the days go right ahead of Wikimania, we had a board meeting um, with our new board. As many of you know, uh, we have two new board members and a new chair, and we said goodbye to two board members, Patricio Lorente, who was our board chair, and Frida Brioshi, who had been with us for some time. Actually, I think it was her second time on the board. Uh, and we had welcomed two new members. We welcomed Natalia Timke from uh, Ukraine and Christoph Henner from France. And our two new board officers are Christoph Henner, who is now our board chair, and Maria Sefadari is now our board vice chair. We had a really good meeting, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the outcomes of that. But before I do, I wanted to talk about some of the things that I heard at Wikimania. Um, we talked at the board meeting about the need for thinking about our shared future. And I was amazed because on Thursday and or sorry, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday, that is really a common theme that I heard. A lot of people talking about a hope and a vision for the future. A feeling as though we as an organization and as a movement had reached a place where we were ready perhaps for change. And we didn't know exactly oh, next slide. We didn't necessarily know exactly what that change would look like, but are nervous and excited and anticipation. There is a feeling that the organization of the Big Media Foundation, some of our affiliate organizations, members of our movement, have really reached a place where what we have accomplished in the last 15 years, we're feeling really good about. We feel as though we've got mature institutions. We feel as though we know, at least on some level, what works and what doesn't for us as a movement. And now it's time for us to take all of those learnings and knowledge and think about how we collectively direct our resources together for the future. We don't know exactly. Oh, next slide. We don't know exactly where that change will take us, right? So, if you had asked us five years ago if we would be in a small town in Italy, I think probably people would have said no. If you had asked people five weeks before Italy, um, I think people would have still had questions about how that was all going to work out. But we know that when we embrace change, uh, we at least try new models and we learn new things. And one of the things that I think people learned in Isinolario was that there are many different ways for us to come together as Wikimedians. There are many different ways for us to live our values. And sometimes we can live those val values in a small town in the Italian Alps. Next slide. So one of the big things that I also heard a lot in addition to this anticipation of change was a desire for inclusivity. It came up time and time again in conversations, this desire for not just having a sense of um, being a welcoming place for the projects, in the projects, I think that came up a lot. And in fact, we had some really exciting statements from our trustees about their commitment to making our projects a friendly and welcoming place, but around making this a place where everybody can find their role. Next slide. And finding ways to bring new people in. So whether that is focusing on safe spaces or focusing on making the projects a place where people know how they can contribute and contribute meaningfully or doing better outreach to individuals around the world who are not yet represented in our projects, there was a real clear appetite for that at all levels of conversation from individual contributors, from um, leaders in our movement, from affiliate organizations, finding ways to bring more people in and give them a sense of how they can contribute to that in ways that are going to make our projects stronger, more inclusive, and, and really more robust. Next slide. 
Another conversation that we had was how can we be relevant and meaningful in new places. One of the exciting uh, events that I attended was actually a meetup of our colleagues from Global South affiliates and, and Global South contributors in general. And they were sharing knowledge and, ex and information about what it was like to work in their context and how could they work more effectively together. What are the things that we can do from a product standpoint, from an engineering standpoint to be more relevant, but also how can we think just a little bit differently about what does it mean to be an engaged, active Wikimedian in a place where you might only have access to the internet in a consistent and stable way once a month. Is that five edits? Are you a Wikimedian? These are interesting questions and these are the things that we know that the foundation is interested in tackling, but we also know that our community is interested in tackling. So it feels like there's an appetite for us to move forward and really take on these questions and be open to what that might mean and how that might make us look in the future. Next slide. And that was really where we came to it, was a future built together. This is something that people expressed a interest in coming together through consensus and collaboration to think about how we move forward. There were a couple meetings that I attended where I looked around the room and people said to, said to me or expressed to me that they feel as though they have so much to offer this movement and really it's a question of how. What are the ways that they can bring their experience? What are the ways that they can bring the history and the learnings of the past, their visions for the future, the work that they've been doing, the professional organizations, networks, collaborations, and partnerships that they have been building and bring them to the movement in a way that allows us to align ourselves and be stronger going forward, be stronger together. Next slide. And so that gets me to the question of preparing for a movement strategy. In the board meeting, we talked a little bit about this. Next slide. There's a clear desire for a unifying vision from across the movement. We've heard this from our affiliates. We've heard it in community feedback to our annual plan at the Wikimedia Foundation. We've seen it in FDC recommendations. We understand that it's the responsibility of our trustees. We know from our engagement survey results that people are looking for a vision that unifies and motivates them. And we also know, on a very pragmatic standpoint, that as we go out and we talk about our endowment and we talk about our long-term future, our donors and supporters are interested in what it is that we're going to do and where it is that we're going to go. Next slide. We have some challenges, and these are some of the things that we talked about at the board meeting. Foundation staff are a little tired. We went through this process from 2014 to 2015. We got to something that really allowed us to give guidance to our annual plan, but we've, we've been there before, and I think people, sort of the word strategy, people need to take a deep breath and find their way to re-engage with the same enthusiasm and momentum. We know from the past, the, the last uh, approach, that community was not totally satisfied with the inclusivity, the engagement, and the consultation. And then this is from a slide that I presented to the board. We were talking about the need for this to be led by permanent leadership. Um, so luckily, cross some of that off. We now have a sense of where it is that we're going in terms of permanent leadership. But we also, and so those are some of the challenges. We also have some needs. There is a need to engage our, our colleagues at the foundation with a compelling vision, one that allows them to know where it is that they fit in and how they can bring their talents to our future. There is a need for our community and organizations to have operating roles within that broader vision. Whatever it is that we're doing, we're not going to succeed if we go it alone. There is a need for us to address and prepare for our longer term opportunities and challenges, to move out of a defensive um, position where we're only talking about what scares us about our future, but think about instead what are the things that we can really achieve when we move all of our resources together, to allocate our resources against a holistic strategy, to think about all of our strengths as a movement across the board, not just necessarily the projects, but also perhaps our global reach, for example allocate our resources against a strategy that thinks about all of the things that we bring to the table. And of course, to build confidence in the permanent leadership team. As I mentioned, this was a slide that I gave to the board, but I think this is really important. People need to know that they can trust where we're going so that they have the sense that there's stability and that with time we will get there. Next slide. So preparation and planning for a broader movement vision. Um, what I committed to the board was that we are going to work on building a movement vision together. It is something that we're going to do inclusively. It's something that we're going to do with community. It's something that we're going to do with partner organizations. It's something that we're going to do with staff. The board agreed. There needs to be ownership from within the organization. We all need to feel as though this is something that we can believe in. What does that mean? It means that we have some experience and processes that have worked well and that have worked less well. We have 
processes that had good parts of it to them and parts that had less great parts to them. So what we want to do is we want to identify all of our stakeholders, all of our resources, and the timelines against which we would want to start moving forward in a strategy process. We want to review the strengths and weaknesses of past processes to see what are the things that we want to take with us into the future, what are the things that we can leave behind. We also should look to other organizations and other movements. While we are very unique, we are unique in, it, in the sense that we are unique among unique institutions. There are other organizations out there, other movements out there that do strategy planning and we can learn from them in order to be more effective going forward. We want to capture stakeholder feedback on how these processes have gone and then we want to make recommendations for a movement-wide process that is truly inclusive, that is on a timeline and that gets us somewhere. So, next slide. Some of the first things that we're going to be doing are organizing sessions with staff, trustees, affiliates, and contributors around our strengths. So what are those movement assets? For example, I mentioned certainly the traffic to our sites, but we also have donors around the world who love and support us. Are there ways that we could engage them more? Our destination, where is it that we see ourselves when we look back 10, 15 years from now? 15 years in, we've achieved a lot. We know that. We can look around and take stock. 15 years forward, what is the stock that we want to take? How do we want to feel about our what we have, how far we've come over 30 years of Wikimedia. Our purpose, why do we want to get there? We've talked a lot about our mission, we know what our mission is, we know what our vision is, but what is it that we want to really do to tangibly make a difference alongside that mission in the world? And then our strategy, what is it that we're going to do to get there? How are we going to allocate those resources? What is that going to mean? What are we going to look like? And to engage our departments across the foundation and a department level discussion around ownership of the vision so that we are all aligned in the same direction and have an understanding about what it is we share. Next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. Wikimania cold. So what does this mean? I talked a little bit about the need for us to put together a timeline. At the high level, I can tell you that the board is looking for us to deliver a strategy within about a year. That's a stretch goal. They understand that for it to be inclusive and meaningful and to be something that we can truly align around and make sure that the movement is excited about. It may take a little bit longer than that, but that's the goal that we're targeting. For the next year, this is sort of what we're thinking about, uh, doing some of the strengths and weakness mapping, auditing what, what it was that worked, identifying our stakeholders, evaluating what we are all um, aligned around, those strengths that I mentioned, those opportunities, uh, looking at the issues around if we are going to move forward in different directions, what does that mean for the way that we are sustained through our revenue model? How do our current programs get us to our vision? Exploring our metrics, are we really truly capturing all the things that we do, not just as a foundation, but as a movement? Right now we can talk about traffic, but does that capture the health of our community? Confirming those timelines, then, I'm, then ideally bringing them to our board of trustees and presenting so that we've got buy-in ahead of the, the board has a November strategy meeting every November, that we've got buy-in on what it is that we're trying to achieve in the timeline that we're trying to do it on, and then getting started really talking to people about what it is through working groups, through discussions, through consultations, in a process that will get us to the future. I don't know exactly what the specifics of that will look like. We will build that together, but this is the goal that has been tasked as the top priority from the board, and this is what we will be working on going forward. As I mentioned, I know there are some challenges, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of you on how we might move forward on this together in a way that makes sense, in a way that is valuable, in a way that brings the best voices, the strong, sorry, not the best voices, the best ideas to the table, in a way that hears strong voices and quiet voices, and builds something that we as a movement can be proud of, we as a movement feel is inclusive, we as a movement feel re reflects our best strengths, that addresses some of our weaknesses, and really creates the future that we all want to see together. So I, you'll hear me talk more about this in the future. Um, this certainly won't be the only thing that we'll be working on, but I wanted to give you a high-level overview of some of the things that we're going to be doing. My goal is to make this as transparent as possible. I plan to present or publish this on, on Wiki, of course, but also to continue to plan in the open so that you have a sense and a holistic sense of where we're going. So when we get started, we know what the plan is and where, um, what the goal is and what the timelines are so that we can hold each other accountable and really make sure this process is meaningful. And that, I think, is it for my update. Awesome. Thanks, Catherine. So now it is question and answer time. 
Um, do you have anything on IRC and, and staff in the room if you want to make your way to the mic over here? So we have three questions from IRC, two uh, for Dan and one for uh, Catherine. So um, questions, uh, question from Joe uh, about the wikimedia.org uh, portal and the changes that you made for the language, de language detection. Um, does that apply to the descriptions uh, for the system projects in the footer as well? No, uh, that page is actually not localized. That's something that we inherited from the old way that it was maintained. Getting it localized is a goal of ours. I don't know when we would be able to do that, though. Um, so those are all in English right now. And um, question from Pine about the same changes. Um, so you said that um, uh, people would uh, are going to uh, the wikis uh, in their language more than before, so that means that they are visiting the larger wikis uh, less. Um, so how does that impact um, uh, the, how they find content? Uh, I mean, so his point is that if a topic is not covered in the smaller language, do we have a way to show them that it might be available in a bigger language? Mm. Yeah, that's a very complex problem. Um, it's something that we've already addressed a little bit in that um, if you search for something which has zero results, we try and like figure out if we actually have something that we can show you. Uh, some work that we're doing right now, and we actually have an A-B test either running right now or just turned off, actually tries detecting the language of the query and then forwarding the results from other wikis. So say, for example, I'm on the Latvian Wikipedia and I find I'm looking for something and I can't find it. If I type the query in English, then it will say, well, I'm showing you results from the English Wikipedia because you didn't find anything in Latvian. But that is a problem that we want to work on a lot, but um, it's actually very hard to make good solutions to it. And it's going to be a long time before we like, have it solved. We'll never solve it, really, but we can make steps. Thank you. Uh, there was a question for Catherine too. Do we? Do you want in the room? Okay, Patty, go ahead. Hello. Oh, okay. My question is for Catherine too. Um, so I actually have two. Um, I was really excited and yet kind of anxious when I heard about a strategy. I've been talking about this for a really long time. I was so I was really excited to see this has become a priority. I guess Catherine and I have two questions. Um, one: if, Has there been any discussion about um, how? a movement strategy will actually be adopted by other parts of our movement. So not just how it applies to what the foundation does going forward, but how other movement organizations or groups think about how they will too change, or if they will change, what they're doing based on that strategy, the results of that strategy. So yes and no. In terms of the specifics of what that will mean for inclusion, no, we haven't talked a at, about that. What what it will look like for, for example, our movement organizations uh, in the future. What will their roles be? What will they take on? But there it has been a conversation, at least at Wikimania and with the trustees, about a commitment to the importance of those organizations in a future strategy and creating a strategy with those organizations and with those voices as full participants because as I said, there's no way that we do this alone. There's only a way that there's only a future if we're doing this together. Um, I think that one thing that I have seen is that there's not necessarily been clarity about what roles other entities within our movement play. Um, there's really only been a focus, from my perspective, in the two years that I've been here, on what the roles of the what the role of the foundation is. And so I think that's an open question. And when I was in uh, at Wikimedia, I spoke with. I had the chance to join a meeting, for example, of the EDs of the chapters, of the chairs of the affiliates, and talk a little bit about what it would mean to participate. And my commitment to them was once we had more clarity about what those potential on-ramps and participation modes would be, we would be able to speak more about how that works for them, how do we make sure that we maximize their participation in a meaningful way, not just a token way, but a meaningful way so that any future strategy is inclusive of them. And it may mean that the foundation just does part of the work that we want to do and that the that other partners within our movement or other individuals within our movement play a role that we all agree on together or fill um, other roles that we know that the foundation is less well-suited to fill. 
Um, and my second question was more practical. Um, it was about resources. Um, so as I've seen other strategy processes obviously go here, um, it seems like a lot of like five to ten percent of a lot of people's time. And so I'm wondering to what extent you're thinking about who or how we're actually going to put dedicated resources against this, where there obviously will be the chance for collaboration and inclusion. I get all that, but in terms of that, there is someone who is not just feeling like they have to balance their own workload and then this on top of it. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Sati. And one thing is that I don't have a, I don't have an answer just yet as to what exactly that will look like. What I will say is that I know from the past two strategy processes that I'm more familiar with at the foundation, the 2010 to 2015 and the more recent 2014 to 2016 conversation, which was more foundation focused, we had dedicated staff members, or sorry, I believe they might have been consultants at the time, including Philippe Baudet running that process in 2010. And then we had um, people who were outside consultants working with us in 2014, 2015. I believe that we will need to have a dedicated coordinator who helps move this forward so that that is not necessarily um, requiring the time of staff members who have other work to do. And then the challenge will be designing a process that is inclusive of all of those perspectives, but that does not sort of cannibalize the time that you are already dedicated to achieving the goals in the annual plan as well as, as, well as other just regular programmatic support. So that's going to be a challenge. It's something that we're going to work on. And that's actually where I think that we can learn not just from creating this um, out of whole cloth as the foundation, but looking at the way other large organizations think about running processes like this, other large movement organizations who have experience in this. I think that um, there's a lot for us to learn externally. There's some things that we can adapt that are appropriate to us, some things that will not be appropriate to us. but. My, my feeling is that's going to be the design challenge of the next few months, and that's really what we're looking to sort of solve for by November. Uh, and the other question uh, for Catherine was from Pine, uh, who wanted an update on the CTO search. <laughs> sure, fine. I don't have the numbers directly in front of me, but I do know that uh, as of the last time I looked, I think we had and this was admittedly about 10 days ago ahead of Wikimania and the board meeting. We had about nine or 10 candidates in the pipeline that we were moving through that people were speaking with. Um, and there were some candidates in there that the team was excited about. Uh, I have not yet had a chance to check in with the team as to how that has progressed over the last 10 days since Wikimania, but that was where we were at the very start of Wikimania. I don't know if there's anyone from the uh, recruiting team in the room who could might be able to provide more details. No takers there. Cool. Well, thank you. Any other questions from the room? Anything else on IRC? OK. Um, should we move on to the, the last portion of this meeting? Um, is there a slide for this? Great, so this is something that I guess was suggested in the last manager's meeting, which was just to devote the last few minutes of this meeting to uh, people sort of coming forward and talking about what they're really excited about, what they really love <laughs> about Wikimedia. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah, just sort of an opportunity to, to talk about what's positive about our work. Um, so if anybody has something that they want to use to get the ball rolling, we've got the mic over here. I have to say that I'm just really excited to hear Catherine talk about a strategy process that focuses on unifying all of our teams with the same vision um, in fundraising. That's something that I think really helps us. So that's something I'm excited about. So uh, I just want to give a shout out to Anna Lance, who was the person that found and identified Culture Amp. Uh, Culture Amp has proved to be a very capable partner who first highlighted a problem and elevated it to the board and then highlighted the progress, which seemed to be very meaningful in getting Catherine as our permanent ED. So as recruiters will tell you, identifying the right talent and the right partner is not a no-brainer. And uh, she stewarded all of that work through a very difficult time under a lot of stress. So that rocks.
this is a bit small for me, sorry, I'll lean forwards. Um, to be kind of short-sighted and think about what makes me happy in the last five minutes, the fact that there's now a discussion going on in the office channel about this, my presentation. So it's nice to have people interested in the wonderful work that Discovery does. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hey, I just wanted to give a shout out to the organizers of uh, our Pride uh, contingent in the parade. Um, Oriel and Eliza, it was our first time. It was a love fest. It was fantastic to know that as an employer and as a group, we supported that, and it was super fun. Next year, drum lines. We have some on the Hangout. Yes. Can you? Uh, we could hear you, and now we can't. Oh. <laughs> uh, there we go. That sounds good, Jelly. It's better now? Yes. All righty. So I just wanted to give a quick shout-out to the off team that have been working with my team, the Woodridge team, and they have been absolutely great. So especially Brendan Black and Mark Bergsma, they have been really, really awesome to work with. And when we were discussing having this week of moment, I was thinking about them. So yeah, thank you for being great. Have one on IRC? Uh, Heather, take, um, take. Yes, uh, we have Jody on ISC uh, giving a shout out to Doreen and Karen for all their work, caring and support for those who went to Romania. And shout out to Ellie as well um, for her help with Wikimedia. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Asaf and Alex. So Peg Grant closes today. It's the end of an era. It's our longest standing grants program and it's changing on to a new form. So um, yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out to you guys. Great job. Any other takers? Anyone online? Okay. Um, I guess for those office, lunch is served. Thanks everyone for attending and happy new fiscal year.